Good morning and welcome to our 11 a.m. service. <laughs> Did I get anybody? No. <laughs> My name is Gene. If you're new here, I serve here at C3 Church as your pastor. Now, I heard that it has been said of getting married that it's kind of like boarding an airplane destined for Florida. But when the plane lands and you arrive, you get off the plane, you notice that you've landed in the Swiss Alps. <laughs> you get involved initially thinking it's going to be all sunshine and rainbows, only to find out it can be kind of cold. <laughs> now, if you don't get cold feet and get back on the plane, if you stick with it, you may notice that skiing can be just as fun as surfing. No sharks. So, <laughs> today we'll be talking about relationship, and that was my best attempt at breaking the ice for you. <laughs> I can ask my wife. I could do this all day long. <laughs> She's like, yes, you can. <laughs> Who do I practice on? Uh, all right, so let's recap. We find ourselves in the rest of the story where prophets continue to weave their way through the account. If you're new here, you may not have heard this. You may not know this. The Bible is not in chronological order. You have to take prophets and put them in the history sections. We've arrived in Ezra, and that's a historical book of the Bible. And we see that Haggai and Zechariah are mentioned by name there. So we know that you can take those books and... Put them right there, just like that, with that noise and everything. They are encouraging the people to rebuild the temple. That's where we started. So let's just go back, look at that again, Ezra 5, 1. At that time, the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, son of Iddo, prophesied to the Jews in Judah and Jerusalem. They prophesied in the name of the God of Israel who is over them. Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, son of Jehozadak, responded by starting again to rebuild the temple of God in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them and helped them. So you're going to kind of see this inward-outward theme going on. And if you read larger sections of the text, you'll kind of notice this. With the governors and the priests, the prophets, there's like this... Both sides of the coin theme. That, that's what we're going to do today. So there's a practical way of doing things, and there's a spiritual way of doing things. And we see that if you look at Ezra and Nehemiah, right? So this comes up. Now, Zechariah, again, like Haggai, he's encouraging the people. Yes, part of it is the temple. It's kind of like a continuation there. But he's really rekindling the spiritual stuff. That's, that's what he's talking more about. So we're going to see more about Jeshua, the priest at this time. The idea here, right from the get-go, is we're to have a personal relationship with Jesus. That then motivates us to the practical stuff, to doing the deeds. But if we're doing all these works without Jesus, it's just a show. So we have to have the purity, the, the hearts that are cleansed to really be doing things the right way. Now, <clears throat> Haggai focused on the rebuilding of the temple. Zechariah more relationship. So there's encouragement to Zerubbabel, the governor, last week. Now, Yeshua, he's the priest. And so it's going to be more about him, not that there's nothing on Zerubbabel here. Practical and now spiritual. Last week, we talked about serving the unshakable kingdom. This week, we're going to focus on serving the unshakable king. So, Let's just take a look. I think I showed this to you last week. Zechariah 1.1, we we'll start right at the top. In November of the second year of King Darius' reign, the Lord gave this message to the prophet Zechariah, son of Berechiah, and the grandson of Ido. I, the Lord, was very angry with your ancestors. Therefore, say to the people, this is what the Lord of heaven's army says, return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of heaven's army. So indeed, we saw that they returned to the work. This theme will carry on now. Return to me physically, come to church, <laughs> then return to me spiritually. So that's why there's a little bit of doing ahead of the spiritual part, but we're going to straighten that order out today. Again, 
Bible's not in chronological order, so I make charts for you, and not the cartoon of me. I cannot draw like that, uh, but the layout here is, right? It would have bigger biceps. That's the joke. So, <laughs> so I'm showing you about-ish where it weaves through, where these prophets would be. So Zechariah, you start out with uh, eight visions. You start with these visions here. Then you move back into Ezra. They get like a formal permission to start rebuilding the temple. Then back to Zechariah, uh, messianic prophecies. I'll talk about what that means in a little bit. It's really kind of more starting at nine, but I'll show you a few things here. And then finally, if we go back to the history of this whole thing, we see that the temple is finally finished. It's done. By my count, it looks like 22 years. That's me. So it's around 20 years it takes to do this. Answer the phone. It's okay. Just don't talk over my sermon. (laughs) Not too easily distracted. All right, so let's overview. What I want to do is overview Zechariah for you, and then I want to point out a few things. Hear me. I'm not saying that it's not all important. It's all very important. I'm not saying you shouldn't read it. You should. So I'm going to encourage you to go read it. Actually, it sounds like a lot, but you can do it all in one sitting because the chapters tend to be fairly short. So it's a 14-chapter book, but it's not a long book of the Bible, really. So I'll overview this, and I'm going to give you the meaning. So some people like to take notes and things like that. So all these visions, they have a symbolism, a meaning. It means something. So I'm just going to give you all of their meaning. Let's kind of go rapid fire here pretty quick. So You'll notice first the man and the horses among the myrtle trees. This is all about God showing mercy again to Jerusalem. That's what that's about. The four horns and four craftsmen. So if you remember, if you've been here for a while, we saw lots of different visions, like especially in Daniel with these horns, these beasts with the horns, and the horns would represent kings or kingdoms and things like that. So now these are the four horns. They're the horns that uh, the nations that gave Israel and Judah trouble, but now these blacksmiths are going to hammer them out. That's like the idea here. So that's what that resembles. The man and the measuring line key verse in that chapter is that God will be a protective wall of fire around you. Uh, Cleansing of Jeshua's garments. This is an interesting one. Uh, It's one you want to read really carefully. Uh, Theme, God's redemptive work for his people. That's a big theme, but there's some cool stuff in there. And if you know about some of the other prophets, you can kind of put it together. So it says specifically that Jeshua is a symbol of this future branch, they call it. So really got to pay close attention when you're reading that because it'll tie back in later. I'll show you where. Then you see a golden uh, lamb stand and the olive trees, and you see like these, all these wicks, the seven wicks. It kind of sounds just like Revelation and the seven churches. So the, you see a similarity there when you're reading that. The point here is that God will empower his people through the Holy Spirit. There's a flying scroll. That's weird. It's about the curse that comes with dishonesty, essentially. The woman in the basket, weird too. <laughs> it represents sin. The woman represents sin, and it goes back back to Babylon, and so where it'll be like set up on an altar, worshipped, right? So the cleansing, removal of the sin, the four chariots, uh, they're heavenly beings that will execute judgment on the earth. So we get through all these different visions that he's seeing here. Now, this is where I kind of start the Messianic prophecies. Most people start them around chapter 9, but I'll show you why. If you don't know what that means, the Messiah is the anointed one in this context, the Christ, kind of same type of of word. It's the Christ that's going to come. It's Emmanuel, the promised God with us. So we can look at this text, um, like, you know, hindsight is 2020. We can look at this text knowing who the Messiah is. But you would have to understand there's a little bit of difficulty if you had no idea. Uh, so the original readers are not seeing it the same way we would. But I'm going to show you if we look at it in specific texts and languages, it becomes really clear. It's, it's pretty amazing. So the early church, uh, they could see it a lot better than the Jewish people could see it. And I'll explain to you why. So these are all things pointing to Jesus. That, that's it. Everything here is just pointing to Jesus. And so we have the symbolic crowning of Jeshua. And so this is a prefigure of Jesus as both the high priest and the king. So they come together. That's usually not the case. So it's usually like a high priest at the time, and then you have a governor, right? So Zerubbabel and Jeshua, or a king. So now I'm a king right now because they're, you know, they've got 
taken over, right? So Cyrus is just letting him do this, th these things. Darius is just letting him do these things. But in the past, you'd always have a king, and then you'd have a priest. Now, both. And so it's kind of weird that Jeshua would be elevated to this position. So if we look at all these together, so I'm going to show you how these things are fulfilled in the New Testament. So you're going to see them all at once. Now, they're not worded exactly the same, and that's not the point, because sometimes it's just a reference. There's something else that happens here. A lot of times, an author will attribute a saying to one prophet, but it's in two different prophets. So he might just list the major prophet, like they have major and minor prophets. So like, for example, in the beginning of Mark, he's doing Isaiah and Malachi. So Isaiah 43, Malachi 3, 1. They're kind of a mashup of the two things. But Mark just says, as it says in Isaiah, and he leaves out Malachi. So just if you see the wording a little different or it says a different prophet's name, there's no problem with that. The idea was not to get this exact. So if we put them up, Zechariah 6.13. Yes, he will build the temple of the Lord. Then he will receive royal honor and will rule as king from his throne. He will also serve as a priest from his throne. And there will be perfect harmony between his two roles. This is prophecy. I'm talking about Jeshua. But if you look at Hebrews, so then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. Revelation, there's some context there. I threw that in there together, the beast and the ten kings. They will go to war against the lamb, that is Jesus, but the lamb will defeat them because... He is Lord of all lords and King of all kings, both. <clears throat> and his called and chosen and faithful ones will be with him, both high priest and high king, together. So that's looking forward at Jesus. So just to go over the next couple chapters, again, they're important, but I want to keep the messianic prophecies in mind. Uh, seven, obedience is better than fasting. Uh, there's a promise of the future, a promise, hope in the future. Uh, chapter eight, then... This is all going to start talking about the reception and the rejection of the Messiah. That's what's at play here. Um, again, Joshua is a prefigure. He's a symbol of Jesus, the Messiah. So here are some key verses. It's pretty amazing. If you think about it, it's written, I'm just using round numbers, uh, about 500 years before Jesus. So the Zechariah part's 500 years prior to the Matthew part. Check it out. Zechariah 9.9, 9, Rejoice, O temple of Zion, literally, daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he's humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. And that's what happens at the triumphal entry when Jesus enters into Jerusalem. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, Tell the people of Jerusalem, again, daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. And Jesus fulfills that. Jesus is betrayed by Judas for 30 pieces of silver. It's going to be a little confusing. I'm not going to go too deep if you have questions about it. You can ask me a Bible study, but the meaning here is clear when you know what's going on. Zechariah 11:12. And I said to them, if you like, give me my wages, whatever I'm worth, but only if you want to. So they counted out for my wages 30 pieces of silver. Matthew 26, 14, then Judas Iscariot, one of the 12 disciples, went to the leading priests and asked, how much will you pay me to betray Jesus to you? And they gave him 30 pieces of silver. That silver was used to buy a field. Zechariah 11, 13, and the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, this magnificent sum at which they valued me. So I took the 30 coins and threw them to the potter in the temple of the Lord. Might not make so much sense when you read it in Zechariah, but then when you see what happens, this fulfilled the prophecy of Jeremiah, I would add, and Zechariah, that says they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price at which he was valued by the people of Israel, and purchased the potter's field as the Lord directed. The piercing of the Messiah's body, in here too, Zechariah 12.10, then I will pour out a spirit of grace and prayer on the family of David and on the people of Jerusalem. They will look on me, whom they have pierced and mourned for him as an only son. They will grieve bitterly for him as a firstborn son who has died. John 19, 36, then these things happened in fulfillment of the scriptures that say not one of his bones will be broken. That's Exodus. They're talking about the Passover lamb. Don't break the bones. And they will look on the one they pierced. That's Zechariah. So we're just going to take two minutes and nerd out completely. So hang in there. I want to show you something really cool. So I'm going to go to a more technical translation uh, of the Bible. But first, I want to just explain something to you. If, again, if you want to know more, you can ask me about the Trinity. We serve a triune God. Right? So this is like not orthodox meaning that denomination, but correct belief. That is the correct Christian belief. Right? The Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. 
all one, all at the same time, three persons, but not separated from oneself, so the Trinity. Really kind of easy to see in the New Testament. Again, if we go back to Mark, Jesus is baptized, and you see Father, right? Son is getting baptized, Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove. Pretty clear. Harder to see in the Old Testament. More difficult. But if you read the Old Testament a lot in short periods of time, you see it. You realize it's all over the place. So from the first chapter, all right, so you have God, then the second verse, the Spirit hovering over the waters. Keep reading a little bit further. I think verse 26, let us make man in our image. There's a plurality to God. And so you're seeing it right there. I heard the sound of him walking in the garden. That's Jesus, right? So he's a person who can walk in the garden with Adam and Eve. And you start seeing it more like Abraham. I think it's Genesis 18, the three men, right? So that come to him. You see symbols of it all over the place. It is said that right here in Zechariah 12, 10, we'll put it up, you can see a very rare picture of the Trinity just in this one verse. Now, <laughs> it's debated, so I'm not saying it definitely is or definitely isn't. And I will say this, this is just an interesting nerd moment. Uh, if you went to Bible college or you studied a lot, they probably told you perhaps the NASB was the most technical translation in the world. It's the best. Here's an example where it's not. <laughs> they actually force a lot of things into the text that just don't belong there. They need to let God's word just speak for itself. And then if it's there, it's there. If it's not, don't cry about it or change the translation. <laughs> so I'm giving you a better translation. This is the LEB. LEB, you can't get a, a hardcover, but it's in like the Bible apps. It's fantastic. It's really, really good because they're not looking at it from a churchy perspective. They're just looking at the text and just translating exactly what it says. It's really good, especially the New Testament. So here you see it. It's interesting. Just look for it. Uh, Zechariah 12, 10. I, so this is in God's voice. God is speaking here. I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit now, this is where NASB forces it. They'll make it a capital S instead of A, the correct article. They'll put the spirit. That is an incorrect translation. Of grace and supplication. Oh, by the way, the 2020 NASB acknowledges it with a little asterisk or a spirit, right? Correcting themselves, but we don't want you to notice we did that. <laughs> and so think about it, right? So God's talking. You do see a spirit. Okay, I'll give you that. And they will look on me whom they pierced and they shall mourn for him as one who wails over an only child, and they will grieve bitterly over him as one grieves over a firstborn. That's interesting. Isn't that weird? In different personages, he's speaking of himself. That's because God, the Father, is talking about Jesus here. Really interesting. The word firstborn now, you get to the Greek Old Testament. That's the lingua franca of the day. That is what the apostles are reading and quoting, not the Hebrew. They're quoting the Greek, and that's why this stuff gets to be clear. That firstborn, like think prototype, is the same exact word used for Abel's firstborn sheep, used to describe Jesus as the firstborn over all creation in Colossians 1, 15. So it's very clear when you're looking at the Greek Old Testament, you go, whoa, you know, it all, all kind of comes together. At least that's what I do. You know, so anyway. you also have the wounding of the shepherd and scattering of the sheep. Zechariah 13, 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, the man who is my partner, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Strike down the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered, and it will turn against the lambs. Matthew 26, 31. There's a good example of not having the whole phrase in here. Jesus just mentions it. On the way, Jesus told them, tonight all of you will desert me, for the scriptures say, God will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. A little different, but he's just, this is the point, right? He's giving you the quick summary. Now, again, just a small note on the Greek. This is kind of interesting. I'll show you something cool. Not only is Jeshua, that is the high priest during Ezra, Zechariah here, <clears throat> not only is he a prefigure of the Messiah, if we look at this again in the version that the apostles would be looking at in the Greek, it becomes incredibly obvious. So I'm just going to show you something. If you look at the word for Jesus, that's what it looks like in Greek. That's exactly what it says for Jeshua. Jesus. So every time you'd be reading that, you'd be reading Jesus, knowing it's not the literal Jesus, but it would be telling you Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. 
So here is what it looks like in the original. So this is both Zechariah and Hebrews put together and below it, the, the third and fourth one. But I underline Jesus. And that's what it looks like both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So it'd be kind of obvious what he's pointing at. Now, if you've been here for a while, this is not the first time we've seen this. Joshua, Jesus, they're all prefigures. So that's what's happening here. So in the Greek, it'll say Jesus for Joshua. So the author of Hebrews capitalizes on that. You can't see it unless you're reading original languages. That's why I have such a passion for doing that, reading the Greek New Testament, I'm a little better at that. The Old Testament's very difficult, but I'm trying. I'm working on it, but I have a real passion for it because it's so eye-opening with these prophecies. You realize this thing is just amazing. It's, it's bulletproof. It's just crazy. So to give you some context with Hebrews, you have the Jewish. Now, Christians, the first Christians were Jewish people, right? So that was the argument in Acts 10, like, what do we do here? Oh, no. Peter gets the vision three times. Ah, it goes out to the Gentiles. They weren't really aware of that right away. But the Hebrew Christians, they're being persecuted. It's a sect, the sect of the Nazarenes for being Christians. And so the temptation is to say, yeah, let's just go back. <laughs> let's just be Jews again, and that's it. None of this Jesus stuff because it's getting us beat up and stuff. Uh, our things are being taken away. That's addressed. We looked at that in Hebrews 10. You accepted it with joy because you noticed, you, know, you knew that better things were waiting in heaven for you. So that's the whole context. When you're reading it, you need to keep thinking of that. And so what the author is doing there is saying Jesus is superior to everything in the Old Testament. And he just keeps naming all these things, pretty rapid fire. Jesus is superior to the prophets, the angels. He's the superior son. Chapter 2, he's the superior son. Chapter 3, he's superior to Moses. 4, he's superior to the other Jesus. That's what he's saying. And it makes it more interesting. He's superior to Joshua. But it says the same name. And so you have to kind of know what he's talking about here. But he grabs it. But he says, if Joshua had succeeded in getting the people to the promised land. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you might know, right? Redeemed from Egypt. You might know that part of the story. They wander around for 40 years, right? Because they're disobedient. They won't go take the land when they're supposed to. So it's a year for each day that they wandered the land. Just Joshua and Caleb are the only ones getting in. Right? So you're going to wander around, but you're not going to get the promised land. Just these two, because they want to go fight. They want to go do what God said. So they wander around. Moses and Aaron die. Hey, look at the promised land, Moses. Ah, you're dead. So that's what happens to him. But Joshua succeeds him, and he goes. And they do capture a lot of the land, but not all of it. They don't do the whole thing. And so Joshua did not succeed in giving them this rest. So God spoke about another day of rest to come. They'll say Hebrews 4.14. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. Now, as for that sin, our sin, <clears throat> we see this. Hebrews 7.26. He is the kind of high priest we need because he is holy and blameless, unstained by sin. He has been set apart from sinners and has been given the highest place of honor in heaven. Unlike those other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices every day. He did this for their own sins first and then for the sins of the people. That high priest, like Jeshua. But this Jesus did it once and for all when he offered himself as the sacrifice for the people's sins. Jesus is both the sacrifice and the high priest. But once and for all, sacrifice. So this is how it comes full circle, the whole thing. So Jesus fulfills the role of Jeshua in Zechariah. So this brings us to a personal application. I talked about it earlier, the governors and the prophets, these practical and spiritual roles here. Um, we're going to pick this up, and we'll look at both sides of the coin now. We talked about doing. So you need to understand to think of it like a coin. A lot of people want one or the other. They can't see both sides at the same time. So if I took a quarter, I put it down, I put it on heads. You know, a lot of uh, Christians would behave this way about it if they're behaving like their theology. They take one side of the coin and you say, okay, this is a quarter. Yes. <laughs> close your eyes. They close your eyes. Flip the quarter over. Open your eyes. Is it the same quarter? No. 
That's what they do. It's unbelievable. And so you get like this camp over here, you know, grace, 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 and this camp over here, works, 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 works. Okay, so this is the correct way to think about it. We are saved by grace through our faith in Jesus Christ. Period. End of story. That is correct. But you need to keep reading. So Ephesians 2.8, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. True, true, true. But there's a little more. <laughs> for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. Why? So we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. A lot of people just like leave that out, right? Why did he save us? Why? So we can do the works, that's what it says in the Greek, the good works, so that we can do works, that he what? Planned for us. You need to think about it that way. That's correct theology. All right, so two of the camps have to come together a little bit sometimes and realize that it's not all this or that. It's not so black and white, right? Very important. So first, we must think about what Jesus did in being that great high priest and the sacrifice. We need to think about that. We need to meditate on that. Jesus, God, would you get crucified for anybody? So think about it. That's crazy. So the salvation, that's the gift. And if we are in him, it is because of that that we're in now right relationship with God. Right? No fancy words. I'm, I'm trying to avoid that, right? So that's what makes us righteous, right? And justified. We're, we're, we're there. We're in right relationship because of what Jesus did. Nothing we did. Got it. But there needs to be a response. There's that verse 10. If there is no response in that relationship, then our belief isn't believable. Within that there, we need to develop, we need to be cultivating that relationship, like all relationships. Talk about marriage for a reason, right? You need to cultivate it. We develop that relationship, and as I said before, then it's not just a simple outward. Anyone can do good stuff, right? But if Jesus motivates it, then it's correct. It's not about us. Right? So I always pick on the people who take selfies. You can take selfies. My daughter takes selfies. It's fine. But when is it wrong? When we're patronizing people and we're saying, look, you know what I mean? Like, I'm awesome. Wrong motive. What you need to trust is that Jesus will see it. And that, like, right, like the lamp. You don't hide a lamp under a basket, correct? Yeah. Anyone who needs to see it is going to see it. Most of all, God sees it because then Jesus continues, right? we got to keep reading. Chapter 6, don't be like the hypocrites when they give to the poor, the needy. They need to blow a trumpet, right? They need to tell everyone what they're doing. So we have to check the motivation. Are we doing what we're doing because we're in right relationship with Jesus because he told us? And that maybe he's going to be the only one who sees it. Well done, good and faithful slave. That's it. That's all I want out of this. That's my only point of selfishness is to please the master. That's it. So... When we're in right relationship, that relationship will both encourage us and convict us in the moment. Right? The Holy Spirit will tell us, Ooh, you know what I mean? Like, put the phone down and just, just do this because Jesus told you to do it. Things like that. So these faith and works must go hand in hand. It's very, very important. One side is not more important than the other. You just must. The key to this is developing that relationship. And that's where a lot of people get stuck. I mean, a lot of people, they're like, I get coming, I get doing good stuff, I get all this stuff, but it's not moving from here to here, right? So there's a disconnect because they're not cultivating the relationship. And so I wanna look at some just simple, fine points for you today. Just really, really simple because I think what happens is, is we get churchy people, we get into church a lot and we take certain things for granted, you know, and like how we got, how did you get there? You know, and we become a pastor, right? You become even more disconnected and you start saying things and people are like, what is, you know, I don't understand. We go from A to like, you know, wherever it is, F, you know, over here, there's like a B and a C. There are some simple steps here. So I just want to encourage you guys with some stuff and equip you with some tools. Because also, 
And part of that doing stuff is letting people know about Jesus. And so I want to just kind of encourage you with one thing you're going to be confronted with. So first thing, let's just go all the way back. Simple, like the absolute basics. First, first, we must have faith in the first place. Saved by God's grace. Through what? Our faith. Well, how do you have faith? Well, you know it's true. Correct? So we can't really believe in something unless we know what that something is and that it's real. Correct? Yeah. So Romans, Paul addresses this. Pretty smart guy. <laughs> Holy Spirit inspires him to write this. Romans 10, 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, How beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring the good news. But not everyone welcomes the good news. For Isaiah the prophet said, Lord, who has believed our message? So faith comes from hearing. That is hearing the good news about Christ. So we need to hear the gospel. We need to know what that is. And we need to know that Jesus is very real in order to have a real relationship with him. You need to know this. And today I've said this, and a lot of longtime Christians, they don't see the need for this, and it's extremely sad. But we are not living in the Judeo-Christian world of 50 years ago. Right? Jesus loves me, this I know, because the Bible tells me so, that I don't read. So you just believe it because your parents believe it. <laughs> I'll get there. Because your parents believe it, somebody else believes it. You just, I don't know. And maybe you don't believe it at all. I don't know. But it's just what we do. Right? We get up on Sunday. We get dressed. We go to church. And that's just what we do. And so I've had older folks, I start getting into, and I'm just staying away from fancy words, just explaining, like, the history of this. And they're like, ah, why do you got to do that? Why are you going to show Greek? You know, we know. You know it's like, <laughs> because here's what's happening in this world. The world's gone mad. Right? <laughs> so we had a brief period. This is what people don't understand. Read the context of Romans again. It was nuts. It was just as crazy as it is today. They're the same issues, same stuff. It's the same. It's crazy. But we went through this, like, lucky period, right, in our country where we were doing financially better. We'll never see that again, <laughs> where you can buy a house, and it's worth, unless you bought it here in Naples, like, 10 years ago, <laughs> you're going to buy a house, and it's going to be worth, like, you know, 100 times more, you know, <laughs> in years to come, where your salary will go up. My dad started working for, like, 7000 a year, $7,000 a year, sorry. <laughs> He's not that old. $7,000 <laughs> a year. He ended up retiring. His retirement pension was $72,000. What? My wife is still working for the same amount she did like 20 years ago. Right? So it's this brief period where everything was like, woo, it's totally great. The sunshine and the rainbows. Now it's not. And people are freaking out, but they're not making the adjustment. That's what needs to happen. Right? So if you're in that age bracket, I'm right at the end of it. So I get it. I get it. I'm right at the end of that age bracket. But you need to adjust. If you care about the young people whom Jesus died for, then you need to adjust. You need to adjust because we talked about it. So Tony told you about it. I told you somewhere around 67% dropout rate from the youth group of your generation. Did it work? Nope. So what do you do? Well, let's just keep doing it the same way, Gene. You know, we need the youth group to be the same way. We got the program. We're doing promise keepers. It didn't work. That's it. 67. It didn't work. So you need to change. You need to look at that child and say, what's going on? Why? So here's what's going on. They're going to college, and they're being told that Jesus wasn't real. That's the bottom line. And so they don't believe that. They're like, this is a fairy tale book. So I just want to take a couple minutes, right? We got food afterwards from Nunzio's. It's really good. Yes, I can juggle those two concepts, Italian food and the Bible. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, so just it's okay, right? It's okay. I'm, I shouldn't even pre-apologize for going a little bit over. I'm going to give you just a little elevator speech information here that you can share with young people. So this is like years and years and years and years. I study this a lot. 
of study, just down into one small thing. How do you deal with that? Not by arguing, not by insulting their professor, you know, it's like, well, just, okay. And I'll give you a short thing. I do this on Easter. I do this when I have a lot of non-Christians around uh, because it's true. I've had people say that. I'll do it. Their kids will look and they'll be like, Pastor Dean was right. And it's like, yeah, he doesn't lie all the time. Imagine that. So, so this is what it is. You ask that person in college, you say, do you believe in Alexander the Great? They're going to say, yes. Why? Because it's in the history books. Of course he's real. Okay, cool. So let's look at that for a second. And you might not get the names right. It doesn't matter. You can go back and watch this. Alexander the Great, you know when he died? They won't, right? Because they don't know. 323 BC, June or July, give or take a day or two. So that's when he died, like 300 years before Jesus. But the only stuff we have in our possession now about him historically comes 300 years and 400 years later. The best being Life of Alexander by Plutarch, 400 years later later. That sounds like the accusation your professor told you about the Bible, right? It was written hundreds of years later, so we can't trust it. It's not in the witness period. Eh, wrong. Wrong. The New Testament of the Bible, I call them 27 witnesses. They're not just two books like Alexander has. They're 27 books. These are witness accounts written by witnesses. And if they didn't know Jesus directly, it was just one short generation after that. Luke, He's hanging out with Paul. He's basically interviewing all the witnesses. It's called a primary document in history. It's gold. 1 Corinthians 15, I go there on Easter because it talks about the resurrection. Paul is a witness. Paul witnessed the resurrected Jesus. He's pointing to other witnesses. It's crazy. Even secular scholars will say that 1 Corinthians was written just 25 years after the crucifixion of Jesus. A lot better than 400. See? meet them where they are and just give them some facts. You know what they're going to do? They're going to fact check you. <laughs> they're on their phone, but it'll be like a little nugget. Ooh, Pastor Gene was right. What else should I listen to? It's a seed. So that was just really quick, but that's where faith starts. And today, let's go back to the text. <laughs> you just need to think about it. Don't just take this for granted, people, if you've been in church for a long time. Hey, he's talking about the Bible, and I'm going to go get lunch. <laughs> just Digest this literally in your mind at what we saw today, 500 years before it's happening. Jesus, Yeshua, put all this together like, what? <laughs> Jesus, he'll ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. He'll be betrayed for exactly 30 pieces of silver. He'll be pierced. And he'll be the great king and high priest. These are faith builders. Or at least they should be. So now that we've been given every reason to believe that Jesus is real, and if you want more, just email me, come talk to me. I talk about this all day. He's very real, and i got to wind it down. <laughs> now we need to get in a real relationship with him. So I just want to talk about some simple keys in building relationship. They work for our interpersonal relationships, and they work with Jesus. So now you know. Faith has come through hearing. You've heard it. Facts. You need love. His love is amazing. Think about it. Literally had passion for it. Zechariah 12, 10, it's talking about God pre-predicting that he would be pierced for the people. That's love. That's what Jesus says about love. That he would die for someone. If I'm being honest, it would be hard to die for someone I didn't love or didn't love me back. It would be easy to die for my wife or my child, right? But Jesus died while we were still sinners for us. That's love. That's amazing. And you know John 3.16, but it's not the only place it says that type of thing. 1 John 4.9, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son, his firstborn son, into the world that we might live through him. What is our response to that? We should love him in return. Another essential element is trust. We need to have trust in him. Because of who he is and what he's done, 
He's fulfilled all this. He's faithful. Some people don't recognize it, but there are a lot of little sayings in the New Testament, just things they would repeat so they could memorize the truth. One of them is in 2 Timothy 2.11. This is a trustworthy saying. If we die with him, we will also live with him. If we endure hardship, we will reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny who he is. He is faithful. He faithfully fulfilled all of those scriptures and more. He's faithful. These are promises. And just as I close today, I want to I share with you a story. I think this is a good faith builder. And, and they help, I think, if we're being honest. We need to spend time with him. We need to spend time. How do we do that? Prayer. We need to pray. You need to be speaking with him. He needs to be walking with you or vice versa, you with him. And it's just amazing. When you look at the statistics, it's scary, but I know it's true, and it doesn't surprise me. Christians really aren't praying. It's like when they're polled or whatever and asked this question in secret, and they're being honest, they're like, no, I don't really pray a lot. What's sad and this is the surprising part. A lot of pastors aren't praying. Three minutes a day, a minute a day. <laughs> pastors, that's your job. It's the most important part of your job. That's it. You know, there's a funny story about a couple of uh, famous people, two famous evangelists back in the day, um, and very famous. And one of them won't take a call from the other. He says, why not? You're talking to God. He's a lot more important than you are. <laughs> That's where you got to be as a pastor. No. <laughs> Someone else can do that. I'm in the middle of a conversation right now. You need to be in that conversation. Our actions need to be guided by the Spirit. So here's where the story comes in. We at C3, we make all of our decisions in prayer. All of them. Like, there's... The, there's little things, right? like Jesus says, like if you see your sheep in a pit, you know, on the Sabbath, are you going to get it out? Yes. There's some things I don't have to think about, right? So some, you know, some, I don't even know, like something really simple, right? So when you get served the food, someone's not going to say like, can I have the lasagna with Big ZD? Nunzios, it's good. So big, <laughs> they donate it. Big ZD, like, hey, can I have that Big ZD? Let me pray about it. <laughs> That's not going to happen. So... <laughs> And that means no in, in Christianese. I found that out like way too late. Finally, pastor, I'll pray about it. I'm like, that means no. You know, so, right? I'll pray about it. Right? No, it's going to be a thing. Take too long. So there's things we know we got to do. But there's some we don't. And so I'll share this story. I shared it with a couple uh, last week. And I realized it's been a long time since I told this story. But it's a really cool faith builder. And it's just worth it for you to hear. So let it strengthen your faith. And it'll give you an idea if you're new about how we roll here. <laughs> we lead with God. So what happened? When we first moved in this building, and yes, it's five years. <laughs> I think it's five years. I think my math is correct on that. That's crazy. It just went by like that. I've been here for about five years. We moved in. And apparently, according to some, the grass literally wasn't green enough. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the admin council knows. The grass wasn't green enough here. And you see the key to filling this place up is to get green grass. Because literally, people will go where the grass is greener. It was that ridiculous. Like, you know, it just, okay. And that was all the time. Putting it on the memo line of the check, you know what I mean? Like, do the landscaping, do the landscaping, do the landscaping. And it's like all we ever heard about. And I, it drove me crazy. So I said, you know what? I'll pray about it. <laughs> now you know what that means. If I say that, we'll pray about it. But we literally did. And what I felt God was saying, to, and if you know the scriptures really well, you know that God can be kind of funny, a little bit sarcastic. So <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's really funny. And so here's kind of what he said to me. It's a test. That was it. No. No. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to help the widows and the orphans. You're going to help the needy and just leave it the way it is, sandy and all, whatever. With the little turtles make their nests in there. No, it's a test. And sure enough, like, I blew it off, and I just instead went to the council. They do the money. I do not do money. They do that. I just get permission, keep away from the money. But when people come, they need stuff, and it's not 
greener grass. <laughs> it's real needs, right? So, so I'm trying to meet those real needs, and just I'm ignoring these people. And I'm thinking, you know what? Find a country club and go do that on Sundays, right? So country club Christians leave here. They do not stay here. You want greener grass? Go somewhere else. They'll be happy to provide it for you. I'm going to keep providing for the widows and the orphans, right? So that, that's what I'm doing, what the Bible tells me, not worried about the grass. They leave. A few months later, a guy comes in. He says, hey, we're putting up a building right nearby you, and we need parking. Now, if you know anything about Naples, the parking lot zoning people are like the gods of Naples. They're in charge of everything. If you don't have enough parking, you can't do any business, right? So if you run a business here, you're like, oh, it's good. You got to be really nice to those people. Should be nice to everybody, right? But especially, <laughs> especially them. Bring them a cup of coffee from here. Keep them happy. So he needs parking. You guys seem like you have a lot of parking. We've been looking 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. You're not doing too much here at church. Correct. We have like a few cars here, just some meetings. Uh, can we use your parking lot? And I'm like, I guess. Let me go back and ask the council. So I go back and ask. It's a no-brainer. I've already prayed about it. So my idea is to say, let's ask them to redo the parking lot. Why not? So we go back and we had some potholes. They go back and say, yeah, you can use our parking lot. You have to redo it. They go back to their people. They come back and talk. They're like, sure, we'll redo the parking lot. Great, new parking lot. That's kind of cool. But you know what? Because of the zoning gods, it came with all new landscaping. They had to completely redo the landscaping, and it was all on them. We're talking about that parking lot and all the landscaping, hundreds of thousands of dollars. If you know anything about a parking lot that big, a lot. Like our whole budget for the year would have been in that parking lot. All glory to God. So that's a practical power of prayer. Do not, especially if you're in leadership, but even people, people are always going to push you to do things before God wants you to do it. Just calm down. Like there's stuff that's immediate, right? But not everything is. And God wants his glory to be revealed in it. And so I say, all glory to God. It sounds simple like a parking lot, but he's, he's speaking to us. He's showing us something, right? One last thing. <clears throat> Are we reading his love letter to us? That's what this is. It's like a love letter. And I'll just draw it a very simple and personal. I've said this before. What if your spouse, marriage, we began on it, we'll end on it. Marriage, what if your spouse or your loved one, whatever it is, they wrote you a love letter and you just kept it sealed up? You didn't read it. Like, what would that say about your relationship? I, mean, I think it would speak volumes unintended, about your relationship. It's much the same with this. What's the difference? So I'll tell you something very quick. I get a special letter once a year from my wife. And it's not on Valentine's Day. We just love each other the other 364 days a year. <laughs> and so once a year, I look forward to it. It comes in an envelope and it has a coin in it. There's a little hint there is what that might be annually. You'll hear her story in a few weeks. It's special to me. I look forward to getting it because I love her. It helps bolster my faith in the relationship. I like it. It feels good to be reminded of all those things. But what if I just kept it on the shelf? She gave it to me and I was like, and then what if she reminded me, hey, I wrote you that letter, I wrote you that letter, and every day she looked and dust was gathering on it. What would that say about a relationship? Now, what happens when you have this, gathering dust, and pastor comes in from God and says, reminds you, hey, you've got to read this, you've got to read this, but you don't. And that's a question you're going to have to answer in your heart. It's important. When Jesus is tempted with the food, Tempted with food, right? Turn that stone in a loaf of bread if you're the son of God. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. This is how we're nurtured. Jesus said so. On that note, I want to pray for you from the scriptures. 1 Peter 1.8, you love him even though you've never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. Lord, I pray that these people would return to you if they need to return to you, that they will draw closer to you in prayer. They'll stop 
the world and the noise for a little while and just draw nearer to you that they'll be brought into joy, love, peace, patience, kindness, self-control, and understanding and compassion for those for whom Jesus died. 